There's a new world coming. Everything gonna be turning over. Everything gonna be turning over. Where you gonna be standing when it comes? There's a new world coming. Everything gonna be turning over. Everything gonna be turning over. Where you gonna be standing when it comes? For far too many years, we've been marching and singing and talking, doing things we thought would make us free. People all around the world been fighting and dying and bleeding. Now it seems that we are going to be. There's a new world coming. Everything going to be turning over. Everything going to be turning over. Where you going to be standing when it comes? You know the book, the Bible. You read it and you'll see. It will surely come to pass. This is how it's going to be. Those that were meek and humble would rise and gain the earth. Those that were shuttered on the bottom would rise and rule the world. There's a new world coming. Everything going to be turning over. Everything going to be turning over. Where you going to be standing when it comes? People of Asia and Africa taking over their lives brothers and sisters to the south of us they really being wise now it seems that all of us got to struggle hand in hand make this world a just place for every woman and man there's a new world coming. Everything gonna be turning over. Everything gonna be turning over. Where you gonna be standing when it comes? There's a new world coming. Thing gonna be turning over. Everything gonna be turning over where you gonna be standing when they come. Good afternoon. So glad to see all your lovely faces. My name is Ebony Noel Golden. I'm so glad y'all are here. Yes, it's a good day to be a black feminist. Um, so I wanna just introduce this, this series uh, by saying a few words about what we are about to witness. This particular conversation, engagement, body rock is what, um, what we're calling it, is a way for us to get into some of the messiness about what it means for black women to occupy public spaces with our voices, with our words, with our songs, with our dances, with our thoughts, and with the ways we challenge what it means to be a human being. So the people that are coming up to share with you, and this is a sharing, this is an interactive amen and yes ma'am and type of situation here at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, they're here from multiple public domains, from the pulpit to the boardroom to the digital space to the theatrical stage. 
the people who are coming to engage in this dialogue with you are folks that are really renowned in all of the ways that we can, we can describe them in terms of their work and their service to community. But in doing so, they're also challenging what it means to be a person in those spaces, to be a person that's in the pulpit, to be the per person that is on the stage. So I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm actually looking forward to hearing this conversation, um, but I just wanted to say a few words to welcome you to Triple Consciousness, Black Feminisms in the Time of Now with Body Rock. Hello, my name is Alicia Boone John Noel. On behalf of the Brooklyn Museum, I'd love to welcome you and thank you so much for coming today. We're thrilled to be collaborating with MAP International Productions as well as 651 Arts and hope that you will continue to enjoy this conversation and please engage. We're also live streaming it, so we'll be taking questions from the live stream. Hello, live stream. Um, please uh, have your questions come in and we'll make sure to have you represented here. Now, Lisa Yancey and Shay Wafer. Hey everybody, hello. I am Shay Wafer, uh, uh, Executive Director of 651 Arts, and um, on behalf of the board and staff of 651, thank you all for showing up. This is our uh, second collaboration with MAP International on a humanities event. Last year we collaborated on um, Double Consciousness, which was about black male identity, and it was uh, a part of the Sekou Sundiano retrospective that happened citywide. So, um, we're honored to be here again to do this again, and as you guys all know, this is the first part of a three-part series, and we hope we, you join us for the second two parts. And uh, real briefly, coming up at 651 Arts, 651 Arts, we have two events. First, next Friday, we're doing a work in progress of a new play by Intozaki Shange, directed by Rodessa Jones and choreographed by Diane McIntyre, and it's happening at the Cumble Theater. Hope you'll join us there. And then we have another event that Lisa's gonna talk about, we have this long collaboration with MAP International, so uh, I'm gonna turn the mic, mic over to her, but again, thank you for coming out. Awesome, thank you, Shay. Welcome, hi. God, it's beautiful, my God. You know, I moved from Brooklyn to Westchester, and I don't get to see this many black faces that often anymore, so I'm just gonna soak this in and this conversation in. This is really an amazing moment. My name is Lisa Yancey. I am honored to be the board chair of MAP International Productions, and I'm also honored to be here to welcome you to this conversation. In the world of art and issues, there are those who stay within familiar territory and those who step past its edges. And then there's MAP. MAP International Productions is a nonprofit producer of challenging new work of contemporary performing artists whose projects raise critical consciousness and spark social change. We support all phases, I mean from idea to stage of the creative process for artists. From concept to the premiere, we, we engage with art audiences and we also look at opportunities to find funding and really bring the concept all the way to the front. Through this heightened focus, MAP International supports an ever evolving and elite cadre of creators, those of whom you probably know and didn't know that we were always in the background. We do this because art that is fired by both brilliance and resistance empowers us as a community to imagine the world as it could be and compels us to act upon that vision. We also think fearless artists are catalysts for advancing ideas that can forge new alliances and transform lives. That's why we do what we do. And today's discussion, Triple Consciousness, is in that same vein. Rasu Jelani, our Director of Community Programs, who's standing here to the right of, you, of my left and your right, he conceived of this program. He conceived of it as a vehicle for reimagining black female identity in America. We're excited to partner with both 651 Arts, continuing that partnership, and the Brooklyn Museum, and we're thankful for the New York City Council of Humanities for funding this, pro this project and making the opportunities for us to be here today. I urge you, I compel you, I hope to inspire you to visit mapinternationals.org to learn what we do. Come to our events, 
know about our artists, and join our community. And with that, I turn it over to my sister, <laughs> my sister in, in spirit and heart, and I call her my cousin, our moderator for today, Ms. Tony Blackman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just coming in from working with a bunch of future feminists up in the woods in Chappaqua. So we had a nice little cipher workshop. So I'm all warmed up. I hope you're warmed up. Um, it's really important, too, to keep in mind what um, Ebony said about interaction, um, energy, engagement. Uh, when Rasu conceived it, 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 it's about us building community and conversation, dialogue. And um, I'm excited to be here. And uh, should I mention Nina? Nina? No, it's okay. okay. Okay, so we're going to go on with the start of the show and the presentation, I should say. Um, so the other panelists, it's I bringing them up, right? Okay. The thing says Ebony. Just want to make sure I'm going by the rules here. So look, I didn't know every lady up here, but I knew of everyone's work who was going to be coming up. And then there are a lot of women here I see whose work I've known for years. And what's beautiful about being in this space today is that we are really at a crossroads culturally and politically and socially and spiritually. And so, too, we have such an opportunity here this afternoon to really spark something within us. And I am honored to, where should we start? Hmm. Check the hashtags for Twitter. Let the people know we're talking. That's, you know, it's really important, right? Triple Consciousness, Body Rock, and Black Femme Now. And um, Pastor Des Desiree Allen, who has the best shoes in the room. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a church family. Well, my, well, they're still there, the church. Um, it's still my family. Um, the church is still part of church. But I'm just so excited to know that Pastor Desiree exists. And can we, do we call you Pastor Desiree or Reverend Desiree? Des? Pastor Zaz. I've heard her called uh, different things. And I just want you guys to bear witness. This is a woman's event, so if you don't mind, don't think I'm shallow for looking at the shoes. Um, Emerald Green. Green representing abundance in life. That's right. Can I get an amen? All right. Um, but she's Associate Pastor of Arts and, and Spiritual Formation at First Corinth Baptist Church and the Executive Director of the Dream Center in Harlem. And uh, yes. So she's doing some profound work, and we're going to hear a lot about what she's up to on her stage. Um, stage Director Charlotte Breathwaite is coming on up. And Charlotte joined the renowned uh, La Mama's, uh, et cetera, as Great Jones repertory as an actor at only 16 years old and performed in New York, all over the world. She is a globe trotter, globe traveler. I'm a director of classical and conventional text, um, multi-talented, opera dance, multimedia, um, all kinds of stuff. And so we're going to hear more about her stage as an artist. She has awards. Um, do you mind if I mention a couple? Okay. <laughs> the uh, Princess Grace Award, the Julian Milton Kaufman Prize, the National Performance Network Creation Fund, um, and is a graduate, an MFA graduate of the Yale School of Drama. You still, you're a professor right now? Okay. And currently an assistant professor of theater arts at MIT. Y'all ready for the brains and the beauty? I hope you're prepared. And, um, Shannon Washington, who I met when I walked in the door, is a creative director and a content maker in the digital space. And um, she's referred to as the next CEO 
in uh, by Refinery Magazine because her work is so profound and so impactful. Shannon has created so many experiences for a lot of major brands, including Sony and um, Perrier, Maybelline. Um, she's got mad skills and has, you worked in TV as well? Yes. And she's worked in television. And she's currently a digital creative director at Gray, New York, where she focuses on Pantene is your client? Pantene is my client. And new business. Yes. All right. So what I really am fascinated by is this, yeah. <laughs> the Feminist Enough video uh -huh. storytelling. Yes. That's hot. We're going to talk about that. Thanks, Bill. And Karma, who you heard and saw and experienced. Karma Maya Johnson is a multidisciplinary performer. She's really pretty good at hot yoga, too. <laughs> She's in that class, and I'm in the back. Like, look at Karma go as I take breaks. <laughs> but I've known Karma. I joke because I've known Karma for um, 20 years or something, and um, as poets in DC. And now we're, we live in Brooklyn, baby. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, Karma sings. She's performed everywhere and brought from Broadway and to MTV at the kitchen, sung with a lot of different noteworthy artists. Um, you were a part of Cave Cano, right? The, uh, and the, the writing program, and has taught everywhere. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what you do and all this stuff. <laughs> okay, so you guys ready to get started? Let's do it. I was gonna do this one. Okay, so one of the things that we're gonna talk about, what I love about Ebony Noel Golden's mind is that she's passionate, she's culturally committed, she's an activist, and she's brilliant and always thinking next level. She doesn't get stuck in the density of information. And then she also doesn't get stuck in the righteousness of, of fight the power. Like she is just, like her heart is, is equally soft and strong and, and just so rooted. And when she talked about this discussion, yeah, she look at you. As she talked about this discussion um, and, and really emphasized this idea of space and what it is we're doing with space to empower black women and girls. And, and these are four different stages, right? These people, we all share different types of, like stage means something different to each of you. Um, I would love to know what it looks like for you on your stage, like the abundance of your stage, the hope, the promise of what your stage. Um, when you look out, Let's say you're in the pulpit, right? Mm -hmm. When you look out, like what, what keeps you fired up? What brings you hope in terms of this space? I mean, I think religion is so, and church and black church are so interesting, right? We kind of come with all these assumptions about what the space should be when we enter it. And so you have to take all that into consideration when you're going up there to preach. And so for me, I like to think that when I'm looking out that um, I'm presenting possibility. Mm -hmm. I'm something that is different or is being reimagined um, as a single black woman in a pulpit um, where I'm refusing to let my body be invisible, where I'm not in a robe, where I'm not in a muumuu, -moo, right? I'm in some good <laughs> shoes and I'm not allowing us to be invisible in that space because even though women make up the majority of um, churches, often when it comes to being in position and power, there are very few. Mm -hmm. And so what do I say? What does my body say and how do I come to mm -hmm. that space mm -hmm. when I'm doing it? And everything in that to me is an act of kind of rebellion mm -hmm. against the status quo when I go up there to talk about God or spirituality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you use, you access your style as a part of your Absolutely. weaponry? Yeah, my, yeah. My Honoring your own yes. yeah, inner style. That's good. And you look good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would... You know, my space, digital is such a, a vast term, right? right? Like, we're yeah. all digital. You got digital probably in your purse right now. Um, <laughs> but in the space that I actually work, I work in the business of images. That's what I do for a living. I create images. And I daily, you know, 
walk this fine line of being a black woman creating images that aren't always for her. You know, that's you know, something that I deal with on a daily basis. But one of the things that brings me joy is because of the digital space is so open and it is, we're living in a time right now where we're actually able to own our own image. It is very <clears> much <throat> more possible. We are not, we don't have to deal with the images that are fed to us for the most part from my industry, we're more so looking at you. Nothing brings me more joy than a good selfie. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, just, just to, you know, to, just to be real, like, you know, not, you know, of course, there's like selfie for look at me sake, but when a woman can stop and appreciate herself and say, I'm pretty, or I'm happy, or I'm having this moment, and I feel really good, and I want to share it with you, we are not used to even seeing ourselves happy on a mass media stage. And so if you really like take a look at that from that level in the sense where if I, you know, if I'm concocting a campaign or something like that and I want women just to really show themselves, there is so much power in that. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is, that is such a, a permission for a lot of women that we may not, we didn't think that we always had the permission to be like, yeah, I'm cute. But <laughs> yes, you are cute, and you should tell people that because by you doing that, you are giving someone permission, permission. in a way to do it for themselves. Hmm. Honoring the selfie. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Carmen. Honoring the selfie. <laughs> oh, I love that, that concept of the interventionist presence, you know, just, that just showing up. Yeah. Our just showing up and just being here changes everything and changes the rooms that, that we're in. Um, hmm. I feel like, especially well in a room like this, you know, you said when you look out to your audience, what do you, you know, I listen, uh, I listen to the room and to the frequency, right? Um, and I'm wondering if, If I can say that um, there's there's a gift inside of my being incarnated as a woman um, that makes my listening um, exponentially multi-dimensional. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot about multiplicities of stories and multiplicities of ways that stories can be told. And I think my work as a director, but also my work as an educator, my work as a human being is a lot about dignity and allowing people to have their dignity, which crosses over from whatever language they speak, whatever religion they participate in, whatever that selfie, you know, that ultimate image of themselves may be. And through my work, trying to always allow that to live and to thrive in like full, you know, multi-colorful dimensions, you know, multi-world dimensions. So also thinking a lot about mythology and creating new mythologies and creating, um, you know, spaces where technology can live and be part of the stories that we tell and the way we see ourselves, you know. So, you know, this black woman conversation can sometimes get a little messy. <laughs> Because some people, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot to explore, right? And so as we look at the abundance and we looked at the challenges and we start to break down some of those challenges, um, we wanted to make sure that we give an, enough weight to the beauty. And what I love about uh, what you all just said in terms of the twist to your answers. Like each of your responses were things I like that kind of caught me like, oh, oh, it made me think. And so Ebony wrote this article essay where she talks about how futuristic black women are. And off and out there, uh, the perception is that we're not. And so I wanted to ask you to pose this question, how is futurism ex expressed through black women and girls. Like, you can look at it historically, you can look at it now, you look at your own personal work, girls or women you work with. How do you see it living and breathing in our world today, the, the futurism that 
black women and girls possess? We're going in order. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, we don't need order. Well, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately um, because of uh, various projects I've been working on is how um, the person I am today is a person that my grandmother, my family's from Barbados, so my grandmother would not have been able to really envision and how far away I am from her reality, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't be the person I am today without her. And um, I also you know, think a lot about, uh, so the theater that you mentioned, La Mama Theater, was founded by a black woman, Ellen Stewart, and some of you may know her. But also, you know, her, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, she passed away a few years ago, but you know, I met Ellen when I was 15, and you know, meeting her at this pinnacle point in my life where there were a lot of changes going on, I, you know, um, we all know how that is when you're 15. <laughs> I mean, I think that there's, um, her, her whole life was about uh, doing things her way and not allowing herself to be boxed in by anybody else's, you know, way of seeing her life. And so I feel like I live my life that way that, you know, you talk about the international places that I've been. Yeah, that has been also part of it. I mean, looking back and just realizing like, yeah, I think that it's, it's necessary that we, um, the future involves, as I said, that whole colorful kind of spectrum of whatever it is that you want and need for your life, but also allowing others to have what they want and they need for their life. And like living in a space of dignity and living in a space, the future is about more people getting access to information, more people getting access to mm -hmm. art. I mean, the fact that this is streaming, I mean, how incredible. I mean, all these things, I mean, I think is, uh, is all part of the future, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think to not piggyback, I kind of hate that word, but to, um, <laughs> when I think about for instance, the Bible, right? When we go and we come to this and we don't see our story and our experiences in it, mm -hmm. and we see it in a very uh, kind of particular way. And I, I love that in this kind of time and as we move forward, that I feel like my story and the story of other black women can be found, right? Because like the Bible doesn't end with like revelation, right? Those are just yeah. happen to be individuals who their, their, their writings got canonized, right? But we all, all of our experiences, to me, in a way, are Bible. They're all stories. They are all things that speak. You don't know how, you don't have to know how scripture to speak. Scripture, right? Right. And so very much this idea of when you're talking about honoring the selfie, by honoring my selfie, right, and talking about my experiences and reimagining the ways that I think about God and spirituality and bringing that, there is a lot more space for women, black women and black girls to find themselves kind of in this, this space of uh, relationship with God. Mm -hmm. But even when you say about, you know, I'm sorry, Charlotte actually touched on the, the topic of access, right? Right. And you and talking about allowing space for women to find themselves, I think that when you put those two together, that is definitely where we're headed. Mm -hmm. In the sense on, you know, on an access level at making, giving women the power, especially young black women on a creative end to actually be in the fields, to be empowered, to make content, to make media, you know, I'm the only, I might piss somebody off, I think I am, um, I'm the only black creative director at my agency. Mm. I am the first, I believe, black female creative director that they've had, may, I may be the second, sorry mm -hmm. Terry, if you're watching. Um, and, and, with, and in that, you're very much in a proximity of not necessarily whiteness, but really seeing kind of like what you've been missing. And, <laughs> and, and, no, and, 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 and not missing in, in terms of, um, of you know, the things that you need, but the missed opportunities that our people have had, the missed opportunities that black women have had to affect culture, right. to affect media, to affect the things that are coming through your screen, whether you click off of them or not. Mm. You know, we're living in a space right now in terms of access, we have the most access that we've ever had, and it's still low. Mm -hmm. It's still shamefully low. And so when you think about putting those two together, using your own story, because you have to come with yourself in your work. You can't right. lose that. Take yourself and put yourself in a, in a position 
where you can use your story to affect others, that is totally where we're going. And it's at the point now, it's like, you know, get on a train or get left mm -hmm. because we're making, I mean, frankly, we're making the best, making the best shit anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I think that it's only gonna go from there, but the most important thing is for us to really, really own our voice and own our image and, and take it to a place where people know that it has to be authentic and it has to be authentically created by us. Right, yeah. right. But, you know, when I think about us as futuristic people, I think first, actually, of our ancestors who knew that we were possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, you know, thank you, because uh, I feel like there's this foundational trope inside of blackness that, that means and that declares that our future is now and that we're claiming it and that, you know, I may be in bondage, but I can see my child and, my, and her child and her child and her child. So I'm going to set this up right now and, and get, you know, this as far along the road as I can, but I know what's, what's, what's coming. Um, so in, the, in terms of the, the, the right now, looking into the, the horizon, like I'll give a shout out, for instance, to the sisters who are doing um, the Black Girls Code project. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. And thinking about our deep history with codes, um, everything from quilts to our songs, um, and then thinking about how you know this uh, the, the the computer codes can be harnessed and, and utilized, like you say, so that we are in authorship of our yes. own rep, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I say one more yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're on this kind of Logan. thing of access and you're talking about the past and so I'm thinking about something about even with the future, our ability to reach back into the past and what I find is with information, for instance, like there are sometimes like my religion is not my grandmother's religion, right? Yeah. I couldn't speak to her about certain things, but through providing certain information, mm -hmm. um, it has helped me knowing the kind of historical and context of, let's say, a Bible story, right? Mm -hmm. So I can sit and talk about the fact that there are not, there's not one Noah story, there are two. One story says they go in two by two, one says they go in seven by seven. That becomes kind of a, a conversation point for my grandmother who is like, what? What is this? <laughs> and you, you kind of have these borrowed beliefs, right? I believe it because my grandmother believed mm -hmm. it or so yeah. and so. But there becomes, there's, there's something so... Um, amazing about watching the chains being broken off of like seniors and elders, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. always talk about the future yes. as children and yeah. those coming up, but mm -hmm. those who are older than us, when you see them wrestling and fighting through these things, and then there's this conversation that happens, mm -hmm. it's the past talking to the future and then this propelling forward. And so the information being able to present, because often even in churches, we're told like, we're not gonna give them that because they can't handle that. Let me give you kind of your, let me give you your vow, your, your, your happy juice for the week until you come back next Sunday, mm -hmm. instead of teaching in a way that allows people to think, you know, you're taught not to question, as yeah. opposed to being able to ask questions, have conversation, and come back with a hunger to be in engagement and not just take whatever pastor says, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and go away, you know, um, with really no new knowledge, no, no more access, mm -hmm. because you're just, you're pretty much just drinking the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I'm well, sorry, y'all, I gotta, um, <laughs> I, I'm very carefully taking in um, because of my background, and there's still a lot of healing that's very present for me. So if you see me when she speaks, you know, it's just like, oh, can, she, can she talk to my uncle? You know, I'm like, yeah, I bring her <laughs> home for Christmas. <laughs> you know, but that's another story, and my mom is going to be mad again that I said that on the live stream. Um, <laughs> so here we are. So my question that came up as you guys are talking, and this is because young women keep asking me this, and I don't talk about it. Well, they checked me, basically, and said, you didn't break it down enough. So they want to know how you got, basically, it's like, how'd you get tight? How'd you get so fly? And so what they were really trying to understand is, how'd you evolve your stage? How did you create this platform? And these were young hip-hop activists who are combating a few things because of our chosen genre of art. 
And so they were dealing with those politics and then trying to understand regular activism and then being black and brown sisters doing this. Act. They were just like, so they, their brains were just like, ah. Oh. But they were alive and excited. And so I just want to throw that out really quick in terms of, did it, did it just show up for you? Um, did it evolve? Was it um, just divine order and you just trusted the process? Did you at 21 or 22 say, this is my vision, this is what I'm doing? Like this stage, like how did you end up with this, this stage in terms that you're using so powerfully? I remember being 19, somewhere on U Street. I'm a Howard woman. Ain't you? Ain't you? And seeing the woman all the way to my right rhyme and being like, I can't do that. Um, but, you know, and it was like a, like Rob Brown, it was like a bunch, like, you know, just like all these women just, you know, these flowing these ciphers. And I was like, well, that's not what I can do. Like, I can do that, but I can't be that. I know that I can't be that, right? And I think um, I originally went to Howard to study medicine because mm. that was what I was supposed to do. Oh, yeah. That was what <laughs> I was given permission to do. <laughs> and there were no other options. <laughs> and, you know, like, I, you know, but that was also a part of responsibility. You know, when you are a first generation college student in your family, you are carrying, uh, you are carrying an ancestry of weight. Yes. along with you. And so, you know, I took photography. That is a very simple, like, photography and seeing how I could start telling my stories visually. And, you know, that formed into, like, you know, where I am right now, but I knew that there were so many stories that were happening within me. I was grappling with a lot, you know, in my, in watching, to, to, to Desiree's point, you know, your parents kind of break down preconceived notions of what life is, and my mother was having her own metamorphosis happen at the same time I was having a metamorphosis, and the only way I knew how to tell my story was visual, because I didn't really have that much of an extroverted voice yet, and so it was a very quiet and safe space for me. Mm. Um, and then it just really blossomed from there, but you know, from day one, knowing that I could make an image, just, it just clicked within me. And then I just, just kind of ran with it. Yeah. Um, as a child, uh, the first time that I remember something um, coming over me, the spirit coming over me, was after my great grandmother's um, funeral and we were all in my auntie's basement and um, I started dancing, and um, the old folks were like, ooh, look at that baby dance. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I, I was like, oh, that, that makes them happy, that's good. That made me so happy, you know, because everybody had been crying all day, you know? <laughs> and so I said, like, oh, make, this is making them happy, so let me keep dancing. And then after a while, I wasn't really there, and I sort of came back afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody visited. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so I, after, you know, I started telling my mother, you know, what do you call it if you're um, an actor and a singer and a dancer at the same time? And she was like, well, an entertainer, or maybe? And I said, okay, mommy, well, that's what I'm gonna be. And <laughs> da, da 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 and I'm gonna da 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 no. But then, you know, the path, of course, is winding. Um, so I was aware that that's what I was gonna do. Um, and I, I think that what happened was, eventually, as a grown-up, I had to take that step off the cliff to say, I'm going to stop doing other things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And eat some beans and rice mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop doing other things, because whatever I feed is what's going, you know, whatever I plant is what I'm going to harvest, mm -hmm. so I better start planting over here if this is what I say I really want. Um, so the courage and the sacrifice is real, as I'm sure we could all testify. Yes. Um, but was it a choice? I mean, because some, some people say it's, they, they didn't have a choice. It's like it pressed on them so hard. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's, not, yeah it's not optional, because no. I, I will certainly become like mentally ill if mm -hmm. I'm not exercising the craft. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Gosh, there, I'm, I'm just listening to all the responses and I'm just thinking that there have been, I continue to define myself on a daily basis. So, mm, you know, mm -hmm. that those definitions have probably <laughs> changed from when I was here to there to, to now. So um, I guess with, you know, one of the really strong moments I remember was being 11 years old in Canada, because I'm from Canada, and I think my mother took me to go see the original cast of Serafina. And that was the first time I had ever seen like in a huge, he's a good show, right? Like I ever saw in a big theater that many people who looked like me. Yeah. And they weren't just singing and dancing, they were singing and dancing and protesting and it was, it was political and it was like, it was on fire and the whole theater, were, and you know, it's Canada, so it's like, you know, people are not like stand up and, and dance kind of people, you know, like, it was just, it was alive and I think, you know, uh, that's probably the earliest real theatrical moment that I remember and I feel like that, at that moment I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna do something that makes people feel like that because I want to feel like that. And as life progressed, I think that, if I think back, there's all, it's, it's been a constant process of meeting collaborators, mentors that have continued to kind of encourage me through their own example of how they live their lives and what they ask for in their life and giving themselves permission. And so that has allowed me permission to give myself permission to keep wanting that next level, that next, you know, insurmountable mountain to be, you know, <laughs> taken mm -hmm. over. And so I feel like I've just continued in that way. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's an interesting question because it's, there hasn't been one particular moment. It's, it's always, and probably my, my family would also say is that since I've been a child, I've always been a person who's just like, well, I want that and I don't want that. And so trying to move forward and to, 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 to mm -hmm. really connect to that, you know, that little voice inside of me that's saying, okay, no, you, you know what you want, so mm -hmm. keep going in that way. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, improvisation has been a massive part of my life going with the flow, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's uh, been a million times where I've been at, you know, one event and then you meet somebody and you like exchange a phone number and then you're like, oh, you know, five years later you're working with that person and it's because for whatever reason the universe, you've asked for something in the universe and then that person has been there to kind of show you a light of that and so keeping on going in that way. So yeah. what kept you though from taking a left turn? What kept you though from I think I've taken a lot of left turns. You have. I, I okay. left home at 15. I took okay. a lot of left turns. You okay. know what I mean? I don't think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think my whole life has been a, a process of like m making mistakes and then, and then trying to, to fix them and trying mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. move forward from them and learn from them and, and, and um, you know, um, pick out the, the, the people and the situations and the, and the books and the, you know, the, the, the media that has, uh, that is actually feeding, as you said, feeding the parts of me that want to be fed and mm -hmm. listening to that hunger and not ignoring it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll save that for the strategies. I have another question in my head. But I, I was so getting to this idea of black feminism, I mentioned to someone, and I'm always still surprised now, I mentioned to someone about the event, and, and there was the, the silent teeth sucking, and I'm, I'm highly sensitive and empathic, so I, I know when you're sucking your teeth in your mind. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I just do like, if you see me like, touch my chest, I'm pressing the voice down, because I am a Virgo. A Virgo's in the house? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, and so I, I thought about it, because I actually grabbed on to being a hip hop feminist before I would stand in this idea of black feminism. Because they were, I was just socialized, like that's not a thing. That is just not a thing. And subconsciously, even though I could speak the talk, I would only speak it in front of certain people, you know? And now I'm all out <laughs> and uh, proud about it. <laughs> and only deal with brothers who are proud about it too. That's right. And, and so it's this space of, when did you 
acknowledge that this 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 concept of black feminism or when did it grab a hold to you or, or who brought it to you and how did you become enlightened with it you can you tell I've been around a lot of 22 year olds <laughs> they has been asking me so many questions and so now I'm like thinking like that again like wondering yeah these questions that we sometimes gloss over because we're so busy doing our busy lives but when did it come to you like how did it First about my mom, mm. um, well, my, my grandmother and my mother, because you know, regardless of the terminology, mm -hmm. they were living um, a truth about women doing what they decided they were gonna do regardless of what else anybody else thought about it. Right. So that's very <clears throat> black. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's real, real black. Um, you know, uh, so I think, like, my mother, for instance, was a, a captain in the military police, you know, like, in the 70s, where in her whole region in the Midwest, no female person had done that before. So it was, she, she was, you know, like you said, you know, again, that, that um, interventionist presence. So for me, I just, I remember being like three and being at the, when she got her bars at the officers, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever, and they say, you know, don't applaud, wait till the end. Of course, I was three, so I was like, that's my mom! You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I remember just knowing that, you know, whatever it is that you decide about yourself, you know, you create, and you mm. walk your own truth. And so that, to me, is like where, where it came from. But then I, then I did have this amazing teacher in high school Interestingly, um, real floofy, elite, private Catholic girls' school, um, 62 of us in the senior class, four of us black. Um, and so I had a women's studies class, though, at this really conservative Catholic school where they had like pictures of the stealth bomber outside the kindergarten classrooms. Mm. And, you know, because they, we, were, we were next door to NIH and a lot of these people were, you know, like this girl went to prom with, what's yeah. his name? Uh, Dan Quayle's little, little boy, whatever. You know, th those people, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> right? So, and, you see, and I was there, growing dreadlocks and getting in trouble every day. So, but there was this amazing teacher, Jenny, who was teaching women's studies, and we had this honors track, women's studies, and I remember that all the other girls had this really ill notion about what feminism was. You know, they didn't want to, like, claim that term. It was definitely a nasty word, um, but she had me reading um, Bell Hooks and Gloria Anselua and all these people when I was, you know, 16, 17. So that gave me a framework that I definitely activated on, you know, from since then and continuing. Mm -hmm. I think I fell into the term feminism or the, the, that concept actually when I was in seminary through um, what, what's called womanism. I don't know if anyone's mm -hmm. ever heard of mm -hmm. womanism, which that is kind of, um, we were kind of taught, you know, that feminism was kind of co-opted by white women and so that womanism was a way for black women to de define themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes from Alice Walker's um, definition of being womanish mm -hmm. and loving women and loving people and loving, and so it was, it was, that is how I kind of learned about all of this. And I don't know whether I'm a womanist or a feminist and oftentimes I didn't like the terms because they were, they were put as, a, as opposed to allowing space for women just to be women and to be more opening, it began to pit women against one another. So I don't know whether feminist, womanist, I know that I, I like spaces and places that allow the opportunity for women to be present and to fully be present as they are to be four different individuals up here and we all, we all kind of fit into the space mm -hmm. um, and to be heard on our own terms and not kind of put together as like a meta narrative. Mm -hmm. And so as I become, you know, as I read more bell hooks, Audrey Lord, whatever I'm, you know, whatever I'm reading, there's just, I see more possibility that opens up. Right. With the, yeah. right. I think for me, when I knew I was a feminist, 
was definitely in my 20s, but I think that I've just always been one. The more and more I think about <laughs> it, and you know, but, but just, you know, as Karma said, like my mom, you know, when I think about, when I equate whatever I'm going through to with how would my mother deal with this, and I learn, and I, and I have memories, and I use those as examples, right? You know, in watching my mother, like yours, my mother was one of the first, you know, black female sergeants, you know, and, and essentially navigated a military life with also single womanhood, which was very, un, single motherhood, I'm sorry, which was very unexpected. And then, you know, going forward to get her education with me in tow and dealing with that and respectability politics before we even knew what that was coming into play and really having a mm -hmm. lot of these mm -hmm. things, you know, kind of come to a head at the kitchen table late at night when she didn't think I was looking and really saying, okay, no matter what, I'm gonna have to do what I'm gonna have to do. And I don't know if that was feminism. I think black women been doing feminism, but we just, you know, it's like Ben had, like, like it's like we like we we've been we like we wrote the book if you really, really think about it in a lot yeah. of ways. But definitely when it when it came to putting a name on it, I would have to say, Joan. When someone handed me uh, my senior year of high school, I want to say when chicken heads come home to roost, and my mind was like, pop, 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 pop. like it was just like, <laughs> oh, and da 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 da. And then you know, then immediately it was like bell hooks, and then RG Lord, and then Barb Jordan. Like just, I went on this voracious spree yeah. of these are all the black women I need to be friends in my head with, and <laughs> but it just, and then it just it just went from there, and it, and it informed everything that I did. Yeah. And so when she says Joan, she's referencing Joan Morgan, who wrote the book "When Chicken Heads Come at Home to Roost." Yeah. Uh, Army. Army. Marine. Who's your mom? Army. Oh, I had the worst mom. National Guard. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> military moms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Single I mean, military. Single military. Yeah. I've never been around that many at once on the stage. All right. <laughs> well. I, you know, to be completely honest, it's the first time, this is the first time that I've ever been in a situation where I've been asked, like, well, are you a feminist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I've just always lived in spaces or been blessed to be in spaces where there have been strong women who are leaders, who are leading their lives, who are... Um, uh, taking care of the people around them, which I think mm -hmm. is a huge part of feminism, yes. that it's about a we, not an I. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, but also I've been around spaces where there have also been strong men who have, per, you know, let the space exist there for that. So, yeah. So, uh, we think about this strength and the strength that's been passed down to us and, um, what, what about when we look through the lens of where there's hurt? Yeah. And hurt as it relates to being able, there are a lot of women who have a stage in their head. They have a platform in their head, but the hurt and the, the wounds that are there, there's, there's stuff in the way. There's stuff in the way. And I think for each of us, the stuff that's in the way may be something different, right? And so what kind of stuff, when you look out there from your stage, maybe not personal, but just amongst the girls and women you work with, what's the stuff that's in the way of them positioning their voices center stage, their ideas, their visions, even themselves, and just being able to honor themselves fully? What's the stuff that's in the way? Well, you brought up already the the idea of giving permission, and I think that that's, um, you know, being able to give yourself permission is a huge thing that needs to kind of establish itself in, in everyone's life, because everyone has hurt. If, you, if you've got blood running through your veins, you've got hurt in your life. There's something that you have to deal with. Um, but that giving permission allows you, whether that's, if you're an artist, I mean, you know, artists, often make some of the most incredible work in their lives out of the places that hurt the most. And so giving yourself permission to let that kind of drive you and not let that be a, mm -hmm. a, a roadblock on the way, but like, okay, this is something that I have to either work 
through, bulldoze through, or work around, or you know, whatever that is, whatever your tactic is, but working through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the shit stem is in the way. <laughs> Wait, the what? You know, I mean. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> I was fortunate enough as a youth to be uh, embraced by a Rastafari community, and I learned a lot about dialectics. <laughs> and so, um, I still use. I feel like there, that, that analysis is so pertinent and so useful. Um, so, I think the economics um, of capitalism are in the way of us um, trusting each other uh, because it, they're, it's designed that way mm -hmm. to produce mistrust. Um, I think that uh, this idea of competition is in the way which makes me really grateful for the ways that I was invited into community by specifically older black lesbian women in Washington, D.C. when I was a munchkin. I think um, at, at age uh, 16, when I was a young percussionist on the music scene and singing and stuff, um, I had some older sisters who saw me and saw the full 360 degrees and said, oh, she's one of us, meaning a creative person, a rebel, or whatever. So, hey, kid, did you do your homework? You wanna come get some spaghetti? You know, cause, and, and then what you doing this weekend? We getting ready to have a memorial for Audre Lorde who just passed away. Do you know her? Do you know who that is? No, who's that? Well, come with us, come. Come and play your drum and learn something and listen to all these women gathered here, these poets and da da da. So yeah, having been raised, you know, raised by these these warrior women, I think you know, I feel so grateful for that because all that other stuff is really it, it, the structure of our lives is in the way. Yeah. I think the myth of um, thinking that there's something wrong with being whole. Mm. is kind of in the way. Mm. This kind of idea that, you know, you, you know, uh, you, you need sometimes a therapist and a good copay. You know, you need certain mm -hmm. things to help you get to the point yes. of, you know, being whole. Like, and you know, I know, I've heard plenty of women and plenty of like, no, black people, we don't go to therapy. Mm -hmm. We don't do this, we don't do that. So we deal and we, we deal with the, um, the dysfunction because we mistake dealing with the dysfunction as strength. And so then we carry these things, our sexual mm. abuse, our, mm. our issues with our body. We carry yeah. these things with us every day, like extra baggage, mm -hmm. extra pounds when you eat the extra bag of cookies. Like mm -hmm. you carry that mm -hmm. instead of doing the things to begin to remove that and say, that this, no, this is okay. I don't have to accept that. I don't have to accept your words. I don't have to accept what you did to me. And we mm -hmm. can't do that. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, the village, we can't always do that by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our mamas and those in our communities can't help us do that because right. They're the ones who taught us right. to just hold on to that. Don't mm -hmm. say anything, shh, don't talk about uncle so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And so we don't deal with those things. Mm -hmm. And then we can't, how can we have a healthy view of ourselves or how do we even give ourselves permission to be when, when we've got that type of, right. when, it's not okay to be. We can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't. I mean, and it, it becomes one of these things where you do see these, you know, you can be the most, not I don't wanna say like out there woman, but you can be the most, you know, self-loving, fully evolved, modern black woman in the world, but still be carrying around so much debt. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, in, in, it's like the debt, you know, the things that happen to you, and I'm, I'm speaking from experience, but also the things that happen to your mother mm -hmm. by your grandmother or vice versa, and it, it gets, you carry it with you because it's not been dealt with. Uh, to answer your t question, Tony, mm -hmm. it was very similar to what uh, Desiree had to say in the sense that there are a lot of things that as much as we progress as women that we still won't touch. And it's yes. the thing that's holding us back is really almost like an aversion to the ugly. Yeah. You know, and, and just we're, we're going to have to deal with it one way because it's starting to manifest itself into legit crazies. 
you know, with us and in, in, in the way that we handle certain things and how we'll have everything together on one end of the spectrum, but we, something, you know, a feather touches us, we just crumble at a certain, at a certain moment. And that's one of those things when we talk about these spaces that we're in and, you know, exchanges of ideas and storytelling and things of that nature, we need to really start embracing kind of the shit. It's your shadow, like there's a yeah. story in the yes. Bible where the healing came mm -hmm. in the shadow. When the person walked through the shadow, that's where they're healing. And if we're not willing to embrace our shadow or all of it, then we don't, we can't. We, we but, can't. but one thing, and I'll, and I'll, I'll shut up. Mm -hmm. um, but one ahead, thing flow, flow. to also remember is that, you know, a lot of that just comes from with, you know, don't talk to me like that. I'm mm -hmm. your mother, mm -hmm. you know, I'm your grandfather, mm -hmm. I'm your uncle, I'm your teacher. Like the things that we're taught to be, you know, good members of society and, you know, yeah. to be proper or, you know, however that may, may have come to you, there has to be a point where you're almost given permission or you have to give, be empowered to give permission to yourself so. to break free and just say, I'm going to protect myself right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. and then see what I can take from you and then what I just have to say, you know what, let's, if we're not going to deal with it, we're going to leave it right here, but I'm not going to bring it along on my journey with me. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great point. Okay. Okay, so I want to go. I want to. I want to let the audience know we're we're gonna s screen a short video, and then we're gonna have you present some s like the strategies that you see working. Want to hear you, a few people share, and to really focus ourselves in so that before we leave this room, uh, we have we didn't have one. And we, this is not a body rock is not a regular triple conscious is not regular panel, right? When you leave the room, you're going to leave the room with something, something to chew on, something to meditate on, something to sit with. And we want you to be a part of that dialogue. And just thinking about the work that exists out there, um, like Akua Sodwa does the Sister to Sister Summit, which has become very successful. Aisha Terman, who I think is in the third discussion has the Black Girl Project. And so there are all these things going on. And, and even the work I've been doing with girls and women with Rhyme Like a Girl, there's a lot, there's a lot at work. And I know a lot of women working. We don't hear about it on CNN or anything, but it's, working. there's some profound change that's happening. So the... You're not going to feminist enough. The video, yeah. The video? Okay. Yeah. So just to give you a bit of a, what you're about to see, just one of I think eight, I should know this, eight or 11 videos. Um, I wanna say in 2011, I saw an opportunity to basically take all of this information, right? All of this academic text and theory or whatnot when we talk about black feminism and distill it down into something that was a bit more personal because if you're not really coming in contact with these directly, and if you're not in a position where you can understand what is actually being told to you, it really does go over your head in a lot of ways. And so <laughs> it's a very, um, you know, feminism, we know feminism is very simple if you really, really think about it. But <laughs> what is feminist work? What is living a feminist life? These are something, because it's so subjective, it does become a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of people mm. to even accept about themselves. And so I said, well, what can I, how can I kind of, put the personal and the academic, which is both important together, but also how can I reach girls, especially, and I mean girls, mm -hmm. with women that look like them, with like the mm -hmm. fly older sisters and men who wanna you know, do it when no one's watching on YouTube, um, <laughs> and really, really show, not, not define what feminism is, but show what feminism looks like. And so what you're about right. to see is just, I think, the first of the second iteration that we did, and this is feminist enough. And you can just. I'm feminist enough to ask for what I want, what I need, and what I deserve on all levels. Oh. I am feminist enough to uphold and celebrate other women's accomplishments. I'm feminist enough to know the difference between flirtation and harassment. I am feminist enough to drive on the first date and let him open the doors and pick up the tab. 
I am feminist enough to be a strong, independent woman, but also know how to empower my man to be a man. I am feminist enough to know that vulnerability is powerful. I'm feminist enough to ball so hard, like, you know, really, really ugly cry, and still be a boss. I am feminist enough to make my own rules as I go and take life by the horns. I'm feminist enough to not deny rape culture and to tell my friends what they need to know about it. I am feminist enough because I am in a long-term loving relationship that is not defined by or influenced by the pursuit of marriage. I'm feminist enough to be feminine and not feel bad about it. I am feminist enough to know that I can have it all. A fabulous career, a wonderful family, and an amazing life. Tony, can I ask you something? Can I? Tony, Tony. There's <laughs> <laughs> so much happening right now. No, she's out. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a performer speaker, and so the pressing of things, <laughs> like I get into the zone, press another button. Um, but I'm learning, I'm learning. Um, this is just one of the ways that women talk back to the project. Um, it is a very social driven project, and those women represent a very small percentage of the different types of voices and communities and women that we, that and participate, but this, was one of my favorites. This came through Instagram and um, a young woman, I don't know if Salome is here, um, but came to a speak I did at NYU <laughs> and wrote this just beautiful piece from her heart about what, what feminism not only is to her, but how she embodies it. And so the wonderful thing about this project is that it's a self-driven space. It is very much uh, what we call user-generated content, but it is very much a woman-made space. And it really does change depending on who actually participates. Mm -hmm. And you can participate on any level that you wish. So you can actually do things like this, or you can submit a video, or you can email me and I'll post it. And it's one of those things where, you know, it's kind of like as fly as we are because it just changes and shifts just much like we do. All right. Am I feminist enough? So you all gonna post yours? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Okay, uh -huh. good. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so is there anyone in the audience that wants to share a strategy that they see working in terms of creating a stage for identity, clarifying our identity, really affirming our identity, um, making a statement about honoring girls, black girls and black women, what's working, um, what strategies are effective. Um, does anyone have feedback? Yes, can you go to the mic, please? So everyone can, I want everybody to hear you, yeah. We're live streaming, so everybody can come to the mic, please. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as a mom raising a young feminist, she's six years old, one of the things that I've been doing is to be honest with her about my life, what I'm doing, whether I'm happy, I'm sad, because I think when I reflect back to my mom, I'm learning things about her life that I didn't know as mm -hmm. a child. So as a, as a mother, being honest and, and showing her what what it really is, what the real real is, you know, as much as I can as she, as she progresses in life, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's nice. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. And if there's someone on this side, you can go to the mic now. Uh. I'm really heartened listening to you women speak, and I'm very conscious of the generations that are in the room, mm -hmm. your generation on the stage and my generation and the transition I'm going through now as I passed 60 mm. and come into what? I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> as I uh, come to grips with that, uh, my life up until this point, up until my mid 50s was what I had envisioned for myself as a teenager, the work that I would do, the things I would be involved in, I didn't envision now, so I'm creating new history. Mm. And it's terrifying and exciting at the same time. 
So what works for me is being in the question, feeling the discomfort, mm. and waiting to see what happens. Yeah. Mm. Asking different people, going to therapy. Uh, what works also is some of the commitments I made in the past as a, um, a woman, as a daughter of Africa, and living in this economic environment, which was, for example, conscious of where I get help. So my mm -hmm. dentist, my gynecologist, my doctor, my lawyer are women of color because I know that we have something to say to each other. Yes. When I dress, I, at this point now, uh, every day I wear at least three things that are made by a woman, artist, jeweler, designer, tailor, or mm. I bought from a woman's store. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the commitments that I keep uh, to empower all of us. And then finally, for me, and it's hard to remember sometimes what I do, and it's always to be grateful. Mm. for whatever mm. comes, and waiting to see the gift that is inside everything that looks like turmoil. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm a little short. Uh, that's hard to follow, but um, <laughs> I, I love what was just said, and then what Karma said as well about this idea of competition. I think we have so much, especially in younger generations, this competition against each other. Um, especially when another woman of color walks in the room, you're immediately assessing how long she's been natural or what her shoes look like. <laughs> and you know, so just, it, it's almost cliche, but empowering each other and thinking almost similar to what was just said, I'm supporting you and I'm buying from your business and I'm, um, becoming one of your constituents instead of shutting you down and tearing you down in this side chick theory and uh, being against each other. I think that empowerment of each other is what we really need right now more than anything. So thank you. Hmm. There's Great a point. theory about being a side chick? What'd you say? There's a theory about being a side chick? Have you seen Scandal? Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I haven't watched in two weeks. Oh no, there's a, there, there's, a, there's a whole science now. And there are tweets in Instagram about being the best side chick possible. There's a celebration of side chick culture. And um, yes, yes, there is. Okay. But go next. Hi. Okay. I'm done. Uh, my name is Anu, and I'm so happy to be here. And I was moved to tears by a lot of what you had to say on um, the stage here today. I never, ever think of myself as a feminist because I just didn't know how to embrace that term, but I'm a feminist in every way possible. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> because I was born in Aries, so I can't help myself. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I see my feminism in my, uh, in my sisterhood. I just love women, I honor women. I have women who support me, who are there for me, no matter what in my life. And I think that um, a lot of of the new generation, the younger generation, don't know about sisterhood in that kind of way, real sisterhood, <coughs> not about just you know getting together to shop or make your hair fly, but women who will come together to pray with you, to do rituals for you, et cetera. And so um, that's how I gain my strength, and um, thank you so much for this forum. Hello. Um, <laughs> It's funny because uh, this made me notice a trend um, in my own family. And I hear a lot of like speaking out to, you know, your friends and people and, you know, creating relationships with new people. But I find for me, it's my old relationships that need the repairing. Yes. I see in my family, I feel like it's something called the Superman theory where, um, you have black women waiting for men to come and save them. And it's like, you don't, need, you don't need to wait for anyone. You have to get up and you have to pick it up for yourself. You have to want it for yourself. And I see my mother, I come from a generation of single mothers. Like it dawned on me, single mothers struggling. And it's like, I don't wanna be that. I don't wanna be that single mother. And it's like, you know, heads up to everybody who has gone through that struggle but you can make better choices. And like feminism is very, it's very empowering. 
And I don't know if I'm a fem feminist. I had to look up the definition while, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, hold on. <laughs> Before I start putting my hand up, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> or you can write your own. That's right. Write your own definition. Yes. Right. right. And I think it's just beautiful to see, like, women really embracing. And you, I can barely see right now, um, but you are on the end. I think you have this. Charlotte. Call. I'm sorry. Yeah, Charlotte. Uh, when you, you, it's hazy. The journey is hazy. I feel like you make left turns and right turns, and it really spoke to me. Because I was like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And I'm like, I'm not doing everything wrong. I'm doing something right, because I'm here right now, and I'm hearing you beautiful ladies speak. But thank you Woo! so much. Hi. 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 Can I just say something to respond to that young lady? The one thing that I've also realized um, now that I look back um, and I look at the lives of other um, people who inspire me, women and men who inspire me, is also that every day, every minute, you have the possibility to make new choices. You know, and I think that's really important because we've all have, we, you know, if you go back in anybody's closet, there's a <laughs> few, you know, spiders and cobwebs and stuff that we'd rather not mention, but it's just that every day, every second, you standing at this mic and saying, I'm here, that's already starting something new, a new path, right? So that's great. I have something I to say oh, to okay, and then we're going to come to this side because I forgot we had another side. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I don't know what your name is. Um, Woman in the plot. Lady in red. Uh, but um, yeah, and this, I think this idea of how we order our lives, thinking it along the binaries of like right and wrong, mm -hmm. and making right and wrong choices. And um, one of the, the, the things that have stuck with me, I read this book um, called Holy Play. It's one of my favorite books, and it has this idea of that in your, you know, we're not robots. We weren't created to be robots. And so this idea that God wants to play with us in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that if, if you come to a fork in the road, and if you, if you can either go right or left, what if God just says to you, I'm with you either way? So this idea that no matter way, which way you go and what choice you make, that God is with you as opposed to if I go left, there ain't no God no more. Or is if I go right, you know, but God is just with me because God is in me. Yes. Even so you so in your choice. Listen. She bring a church on Saturday. Saturday. There's a church on Saturday. We can take a time. Put the nice shoes on. <laughs> that, no, this is good. This is good. This is what this is what um, six fifty one Arts and uh, Map International and Ebony and Rasu wanted to happen. It's perfect. Yes. Actually, Rasu is uh, one of the reasons I'm going to say this. Yeah. It's not just about the women that surround us and bring us up. It's about the men. Yes. So it's yeah. about finding men who support powerful women, see us, allow us to see them, and support us, like putting on events like this for us today. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Candace, and I am an ordained interfaith and interspiritual minister. And one of the things that I feel is really critical for all of us is daily spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And that can look all kinds of ways. But going within and experiencing the light within yourself, and then listening to it and acting upon it is a way to heal, to experience creativity, uh, there's a lot of pain in my extended family around alcoholism. And when I was in seminary studying Yoruba, I decided to call on my grandmother who died at the age of 39 from cirrhosis of the liver. And then when I talked to my mother about it, who was much more of a traditional Christian, rather than looking at me like I was crazy, she just opened up and started crying because she had never really talked to me about her mother. She was carrying mm. that burden. and. Um, I feel that by going within and trusting and being open to whatever kind of experience, it really enables us to heal, it feeds our creativity, and it allows us to connect with other people knowing that there really is no other. Mm. Tony, can I, can I respond to that? Just, yeah, no, just I'm go, like, go. I'm no, hey, we fine. But, but sis, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name. But, one thing that that really, really speaks to in terms of like strategies and the way that we think about our lives is giving ourselves, and I hate to use this term, but not a permission, but knowing that it is okay to rest. Mm. Like it is okay to chill. It is okay to turn 
you know, everything off. It is okay to just buy a ticket and leave. It is okay to just. And that is so not a part of our traditions. Yeah, it's not. They, I, I learned that via um, a, a, a Jewish uh, boss. Yeah. Oh, because they were who sat like, down with, boss. who told me her mother taught her. And then there was a mentor who self-proclaimed herself my Jewish mother at one of my jobs. And it was just this space where I, I've always been global and so I just seek out the information. But it was just like some keep it, she was so raw and keep it real with me. Mm -hmm. And we had these discussions, you know, we used to have, we had fights too. It was the first elder I fought with like that. But 20 years later, like I, I sent that woman a card, a copy of my book, and I'm like, yo, you set me up. And so I find myself having this conversation with women every month. Where I'm giving them permission, as if I'm somebody, to take the day off, right. or to go away for the weekend, right. or to not call that girlfriend back who you told me was toxic and why she's still at your house on Friday nights right. with her husband, because you don't even like her no more. Like, <laughs> you know, and she's like, oh, well, you know, you're with Virgo, and you're, no. <laughs> you, you, you gotta take care of you. Yes, yeah. so powerful. That, is deep and profound for us. I, yeah. I even want to start like a circle, like a support group, but take a day off. Listen, I, st I started a website dedicated to it. <laughs> like Parlor, Parlor Magazine, like it is dedicated to, I mean, it, it definitely evolved, but we, what we are about right now is the power to rest and the power to chill and discover yourself, go somewhere else. It could be 20 miles away, it could be 2,000 miles away, but you're not really going to get anywhere unless you start listening to yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you have to literally go in the middle of a cornfield or on a glacier or anywhere else to find it, by any means necessary, yes. rest. Yes. Rest. Turn down for a dick. Turn down because I'm tired. Turn down, Turn down because you're tired, said the pastor. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Alana. Actually, to speak on your whole point of rest, that's, I just thought about that. That's actually in the Declaration of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is the right to rest. I don't think that a lot of times we do rest as black women and women of color, just in general, because we're always told we have to keep going, we have to keep doing, and we're Be like strong. the pillars of our community. <laughs> but I actually, you, to answer your question originally, which was, what are we doing right? I think having panels, having forums is what we're doing right. I actually learned about this panel in my class. I took a break today from writing. <laughs> I, shh, don't tell my parents. <laughs> I know it's live though, no it's live. Yeah, I learned from um, another girl in my class and we were talking, we were discussing, she was like, you should go over to the Brooklyn Museum this weekend because they're gonna have a panel. And I was like, really? So we were always talking because in my major, I'm studying at John Jay and so my major is humanities and justice rights and justice studies actually. So I'm writing a paper, my, my prospectus is on black hair politics and Eurocentric beauty ideals and standards. So she said, go check it out and I said, okay. And I think that's what's really great right now, living in this social media world. We get to exchange ideas and we get to talk to each other about it. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I just want to mention really quickly, I don't know if some of these sisters are in the room, but um, uh, Black Women's Blueprint. I don't know if any of those people are here, but they have a, yeah. <laughs> That's a, um, you, sister who, the sister who just spoke, you, you reminded me of them because they are doing some of that work providing space, like having, holding sister circles once a week. You can just show so, up. So Google Black yep. Women's Blueprint and yep. their discussions, conversations, mm -hmm. forums, workshops, panels, and a lot of transformative, moments being created and I'm um, here in Brooklyn through so make sure you look them up there's another website fierceforblackwomen.com mm -hmm. which is doing a lot around black women's health issues and just did a really comprehensive study on fiber tumors and some other things like that so they I, I love this this is some stuff bubbling right now oh, wait who's that oh you were are oh, you were go ahead I, I just want to um, clarify that you know a lot when we talk about um, black women being like leaders, you know, I come from a culture where black, uh, the women are not leaders. So you have mm. to learn to sort of, when you, you know, you're quieted down, your, your rage, right. your, your ability to speak up, your ability to exist is, you know, it's sort of calm that down 
because it's not okay in a culture where it's patriarchy, in a culture where your mother, your grandmother, they're, they're, they do a great job raising you, they do a great job having a family, but um, they don't like this, this thing that that's been created by bringing you here and coming across women that are so powerful and coming across women that are love themselves and, and, and women that fight for women, not only anything, but women that fights for feminism, the, the, the notion of just, hey, I can be who I am. I can, mm. I can you know, I, I'm, in, um, I'm in science and research where you don't see black women, you see white males, but the fact that you have to sort of in, make yourself invisible tells you mm -hmm. why even these things um, are, are available to us. And I, I was really taken back by Shannon because you have this, thing where it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's power that, like, you know, also like Charlotte had said, it's a many, many left turns where you're like, whoa, 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 should I be black and I'm proud? Should I be radical? Oh, I don't think that's for me. <laughs> or, you know, or, or, or do you say, can we just be existing? Can we just be who we are? So I think, to me, coming here and seeing so many faces is not only teaching me about what I need to do to sort of speak louder, because it's something that, you know, it's, a, it's conditioned. It's something that you learn to don't speak. Mm -hmm. And not speak in a sense of verbally speak, but to allow yourself to open and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let my solitude be loud. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm gonna do that. And, and, um, and I think that's why I'm just, that's why I'm just so taken back by just hearing all these stories and hearing, hearing these women in front of me and, and, and the, their journeys and their continual journeys and there'll be a time where I'll say, hey, there's a time where I'm quite unsure what feminism is because feminism is, is to me seems political, but, but feminism doesn't have to have a word. Feminism is existence. It's about just being you, not only being black, be, but being you because you are divine. And that's why I feel like I needed to share my story with everyone because it's it's so powerful just to see that. Yeah, and thank you for sharing. That, thank you for sharing. And thank you for sharing and being so, so transparent and so vulnerable on the mic. And I was raised in a patriarchal family, and, and I, I was taught to not be too much of a leader. I am that poem. I don't know if that poem is a Carolyn Rogers poem. Not too hard, not too soft, not too this, not too this. I mean, just two years ago, my mom gave me a lecture on running the men away because I was too strong. And she meant no harm. God bless her for loving me. <laughs> but let but me know, stop. I have Wait. to say, though, that even though we disagree with that particular message from our mothers, they're actually right in the sense that patriarchy is universal on planet Earth yeah. mm. right now. Really Regardless is. of the specifics yeah. of your nuclear family and who was expressing what. Like, I talked about my mama being a soldier, but she was a soldier in the patriarchy, so it is not. Yeah. You know, right. Right. So it's not like anybody has escaped from that. Right. Um, so you know, big ups to the men who are evolving through their feminism, so that they can take it. Yes. Right. <laughs> okay, over here, over here. Just touching on the idea of, like you said. Make sure you speak into the mic because we're live streaming. Okay. yourself to say no and stepping back from your norms and your family's norms and it's okay to actually tell your mother your ideology and your theory is not okay for me and that's not you taking a left turn or going against your mother or whoever's in your life holding you back in your evolution it's you have to at some point say no and know that it's okay mm -hmm. saying no I've got notes, same thing, no. no. rituals. Yes, yes, that's powerful. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. My name is Beatrice. Um, my contribution, uh, or what I have acknowledged as what is working, are safer spaces, safer spaces where we can be our full identity. Mm. Um, so for me, even in my most recent experiences, acknowledging that on the, the path to peace, I somehow skip over anger and find sadness. But anger is such an important part of the evolution of who I am. Um, and so creating safer spaces, specifically of women of color, to have opportunity to allow either through pen, through song, through dance, through movement, through shouting. Primal screaming is wonderful. 
<laughs> but having safer spaces to actually exercise that anger, to release it, to use it, and then to, to, to fine tune it through practice, because I very much believe in that, to fine tune it through practice to then continue to transcend or, or work through it is such an incredible tool um, that I, I think that is something that I have experienced being done, um, not specifically in an all woman of color group, but in a people of color group. Um, I'd like to offer Love Circle Sangha. They meet every, th every third Sunday mm -hmm. at the Brooklyn Zen Center. And the purpose of this is to use practice of the Dharma, practice of mindfulness, practice of listening in, tuning in, to activate and see how we can um, see ourselves as clear as possible, love ourselves as much as possible, and to find our liberation by accessing our tools that we walk with. Um, so that is what I wanted to offer. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that. We're going to go through these four really quick. And then I realize um, time is of the essence. Uh, you guys got me open. And we, we need to make space for at least one question for the panel. And if the panel has something else they need to say. So I'm going to be quick. I'm Whitney Hunter. Um, okay. I, I took notes because uh, I went to Howard University and there is a woman there, the late Dr. Sherelle Berriman Johnson, Yay! who taught me the, the key thing that she taught me was come correct. <laughs> yes. So I'm taking notes. Uh, so the notes I'm taking in reference to strategy, um, it's anecdotal. My cousin several years ago went to Hawaii all by herself out of nowhere. I didn't understand what in the world she was doing. Uh, and never really got to the bottom of why she did it. But sitting here today dawns on me that she did it because she needed to empower herself. She needed to sit with herself and be with herself and give herself permission to do what she wanted to do. So I don't know if the women in my family who raised me consider themselves feminist, womanists, or what, but uh, based on today and based on my still very ignorant uh, information, um, <laughs> I would say they are. So I think that this idea of empowering and giving oneself permission uh, is a strategy that is, uh, should not be overlooked at all. Thank you. Hi, Tony. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so one thing that um, I'm constantly trying to do, and I surround myself with women who are doing the same thing, whether they know it or not, is um, to come out as a feminist. You know, lots of um, similar <laughs> movements have their coming out period. You know, if you're queer identified, maybe you come out. If you're a victim of violence, maybe you stand up and, and, and testify to that and share your story. And then people can understand and come to you through that. And maybe a lot of times people say, I didn't know this person was, you know, whatever that box you check next to that person. Mm -hmm. But I like that person or I have access to that person. And now that I know that they're identified in this particular way, it opens that up to me. So, you mm -hmm. know, I have a jacket where I wear a pin and it says feminist, or I have a tote bag and it says feminist press on it, or I have, you know, all kinds of things that are very small, but then people see you, they're on the subway, they look at you, they're like, that's a feminist, what? You know, or like you're in a space, I'm, I'm you know, everywhere I am digitally and all my um, profiles, it says this is a feminist. You know, I'm very clear about how I'm purposefully identifying myself and the people I'm around mm -hmm, do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so when you're very, whatever you are, you know, in your place of business or in your, you know, artwork or just, you know, with family and friends, um, people might be drawn to you in a particular way because right. they like you, they think you're fun and special or pretty or whatever, I don't know what it is. And then they also see, and that's a feminist, and it broadens their mind and then maybe they can come to you and ask you about it. So um, that's a thing to do to just, um, invite people in to let them know. You don't have to be a feminist in the closet. You can be a feminist right. out. And, um, <laughs> and then when you do that, you might just want to have your little, you know, like elevator pitch ready. So then people are like, what's that thing about? You know, you're a feminist, that's crazy. And you're like, well, actually. And then you can give them a little information. So it's like, you just bring them in. You know, I'm sure like my sister up there, that's um, part of the clergy, that you can bring people in with the shoes, right? Girl, look at those shoes. And you're like, by the way, I was blessed and I got these shoes and let me tell you, you know what I mean? So like, you just talk about it, that's all. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Hi, so going along with that, I think that it's become increasingly important that we address and explore and express the fluidity, the fluidity of feminism and that there are women out there who can 
be uh, I can do all, I can do bad all by myself, and they can open their own doors, they pay for their own tasks. But then there are other women who would like the door to be open for them, would like to be catered to, and there are women who like both those things. It's not a binary, and it it goes in many different places, and it goes in many different areas. And I think the the problem with or the why men and women and gender non-conforming people attribute words and phrases and theories to this word that are no longer really true at this point are because of the stereotypes that have been around since first wave, since, it, since this word feminism first came about. And even if those things weren't true, that's what, how people still see it. And so it's just letting people know that this is not actually what the word means. It has right. grown, it has changed, it's different for every single person. And just because you identify doesn't mean that you hate men or you you are sticking to this one idea of what the word means. And there, there's womanism, there's feminism, there's black feminism, there's all these different things. And you don't have to, it's more about letting yourself define the label than letting the label define you. Absolutely. Yes. So thank you so much for the conversation. I feel like there's so much that I learned that it's hard to sort of pick one thing that I kind of want to uh, piggyback off of. Um, but I'm a historian, so I found the question about futurism really fascinating, some of your responses. And what I love was how um, what was said was that sometimes we can go to our elders and sort of have them rethink things that for them is a norm. And that is also a kind of progress, right? That's a kind of advancement. Because often what happens is we only think of our children as the future, right? We don't see the people that came before us as also a part of our future. So I kind of love how this conversation opened that up. Um, and then thinking in terms of futurism as well, um, I've been thinking a lot about Madam C.J. Walker in terms of the ways that now like black hair care has exploded. Um, but there's a way in which she is still so, she's light years ahead of anything that I see in terms of like black women owning their own businesses, owning the means of production with, um, with our own hair care line. So again, there's a way in which the past is not just like this static dead place, right? It's constantly being refashioned and we can use it to inspire us um, to move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Karma. I'm going to press the... Mm -hmm. it, this is so perfect, the sister who just spoke, um, because this... Uh, oh, okay, well, there's that also. This, um, this uh, Sankofic principle, right, of going back to go forward is something that keeps coming back to me when I think about what this, this whole thing means, black feminism. But the, the, there's a little video clip that I wanted to show because the whole, is it, is it, it's in there it's like in the it. next thing. Because I'm thinking about the generational um, changes in, in the conception and, um, oh, that's the beautiful, oh, there's Beatrice. Beatrice, look at you. All right. Beatrice is one of the performers in this um, photo which comes out of um, my blues opera. But that's about women circling and creating community. Mm -hmm. That's why I put that photo in there. But this one right here, um, in Chicago, I have to rep my hometown. So in Chicago, particularly on the west side, okay, I'm, I'm looking at um, a lot of videos and doing some research right now about specifically um, the way that uh, young black women are embodying um, complex concepts within um, uh, quantum physics and um, um, mathematics in the way that they uh, work with fractals in their footwork. And a lot of the specific movements that I see them doing um, look like uh, the specific movements that manifest when certain West African deities, particularly Akan deities, manifest, particularly Sankofa. Um, the, the angles of the feet um, and the patterns that they're creating, Sankofa dance. Now, these are sisters on the west side of Chicago who definitely say no if you ask them if they were African, definitely say no if you ask them if they're a feminist, and yet they're embodying this thing that says, I'm gonna take this physical power that I have, I'm gonna express it artistically, and I'm gonna conquer this male-dominated space. So. The war zone returns October 3rd.
just one that comes right after that. You can slide it forward, baby. Because that's just the end of the night. It's about to turn it Well, it used to be Jukin. Originally, when it was when nobody had heard of it, they called it Jukin, which again is an old word, right? Right, right. But now it's uh, people know what it is now, so it's footwork now, Chicago footwork. So in 30 years, you'll see like the international footwork championships, and they'll Absolutely. be Absolutely. <laughs> and the winners will all be blonde. Right. But right now, right. in Denmark, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, let's be real. <laughs> uh, let's keep it real. Okay, so um, it's 3.58. We wanted to just make space if there are one or two questions for our panelists. If not, it's okay, because we can have them speak. Yes. What brings you joy? What brings you joy is the question. What brings you joy? My couch. I literally was gonna say rest, but yeah, rest. It could be the couch, it could be the car, yeah. the floor. Any flat surface. Just, yeah. <laughs> Music. But first, the first thing I thought of when you said that was you. Like this brings me joy, yeah. But music. Um, it's a big question. I mean, a lot of things bring me joy. I mean, I would also agree that, you know, being with people, so traveling gives me a lot of joy, like getting a ticket and going somewhere where I don't understand the language, I don't know what I'm eating, like just really always setting myself in situations where like things are new and cause me to rethink. <laughs> Yeah, and I struggle between, I don't know if it's, if it's the cipher, like I love hosting ciphers, being a part of ciphers, being in the cipher, which is basically this kind of thing, and, and food. Yes. And so I love to cook, and even though I'm now on a healing diet that demands that I do less cooked food, I, I find myself now absorbed in raw food preparation and my dehydrator. And so I love this idea, and I, and I think I got it from my grandma, and so although if I eat what she cooked us, I'd probably be in the hospital with my sensitive self, but I ate that for the first 20 years of my life, but that idea of preparing food and sharing it um, and having people enjoy it, I just, like, it's, when my apartment got robbed, um, broken into that night, I, I was gonna cook anyway because my boyfriend was coming by, we're gonna cook and eat, and I ended up cooking like 20 people were coming over and then everybody looked at me like I was crazy, like you just got robbed, the police are coming here. I realized that was, I was in therapy. Mm. Yeah. I made stuff I couldn't eat, I made a casserole, <laughs> I baked some fish, like I was just like, I was, but I couldn't stop cooking. Cause it was the second time my apartment got robbed and, and that was it, but I love, yes, yeah, so I love food. Food, I love food. I wish we had some food, Shay. Wait, where we have food right. today? <laughs> Yeah. This is 651, map it in Nashville. You guys don't vote. Okay. Maybe this, that should be a the conversation. Song? Yeah. So yeah. we don't have food, but uh, <laughs> I just want to remind everybody before you leave and before this ends that we do have some samples from uh, Cabin Kinks, from our new who's here, <laughs> for our natural hair. So be sure that you, our new essentials, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, so please make sure you uh, take a sample. I and mean, we talked a lot, a lot today about taking care of ourselves and about hair, about Madam C.J. Walker, and we have someone who is creating her own products in our midst right here, so. Really important. Those are available. Really important. So anything you all need to mention? We, in terms of um, the folks here, Ebony, uh, Rasu, before we wrap up, is there anything we need to bring? To we should, uh, do you have the other two events available? Ebony has it, okay. The card, yeah, I don't have it. Oh, Ebony. Okay. Hey. Hi, Ebony. Thank y'all so much. I'm Southern, so we, I say y'all. Um, but before I, before I do that, I wanted to make sure we didn't have any questions from the live stream. 
Do we have any questions? Okay. Okay. Not, not hey, live, everybody. No questions yet. Wave, just wave to the live stream, people. Thank you all for being here with us, cyberspace. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have two more encounters, engagements. On November 8th, Mythologies of the Diva, Reexamining the Image of Black Women in Popular Culture. This engagement will be moderated by Shani Jamila. And the, our final engagement will be uh, Beyond Binaries and Boxes, Deconstructing and Re-Envisioning Black Feminisms. And I will be host, um, facilitating that. It won't be a panel, it won't be a conversation, it'll be a strategy session. So come back um, for the next two. Next time on November 8th, we're going to have a reception and a live DJ mixing. So come back, <laughs> every week is gonna be something different. So um, thank you. And thank make you. sure you tell um, folks about the dialogue. A lot of people are talking about this stuff over the coffee table, on the phone, and these conversations, it's a lot of this is coming up. And so it's really great that there's like an organized space for learning, for venting, for building, and for connecting. And um, I think it's really important that when we get information, we share it. And so even if you're not sure, to just let 10 people know who you think might be interested to find out. Because there's a lot of information out there and it's kind of hard for it to land because some of us can get so busy. And then we hear about it, like the sister who showed up because of the class today. Mm -hmm. Oh, you over there. <laughs> Yes. So um, I'm honored to have been a part of this conversation. I'm sending my prayers up for my sister Nina Angela Mercer, and who's not here with us. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Okay. And so, if you want to cipher in the lobby, yes, highlight. We can cipher out front. <laughs>